All right. Okay. So the guy that was making this, uh, that was out there with uh, this man making this movie and PR it and say it on the set and make it happen is Rob Harris. He's here with us today. Um, and what I thought we'd talk about in this first small session would be just more about the creative and the writing end of it. Before we uh, jump into it, why don't you tell us, uh, using this as a specific example, what does a unit publicist do? I hang out. You hang out. I hang out. Um, mostly what um, uh, the unit publicist is a publicist, public relations person who travels with the movie, stays with the movie during production, and is the liaison between the public and the production, the press and the production, and the studio and the production. Um, the latter is often confusing because one normally thinks that the producer is the liaison between the studio and the production. But, and to a degree, that's certainly true. But um, marketing questions, marketing issues are uh, laid out from the very earliest juncture. And quite often, the studio doesn't know what kind of movie the director is, is um, making, which seems a little odd because they've given him the money to make the movie. But um, what you're doing is um, uh, sort of interpreting how the movie is going to be presented to the public at the earliest stages. And then what I do is um, uh, I'll invite some press to the set sometimes, if it's an open set, and start stacking up interviews, most of which are held uh, until the movie is released. Um, but um, uh, it's all about putting together the materials that the studio is ultimately going to need to sell the movie six months, 12 months down the line when it's released in theaters. So that's what I do. I sort of set up the um, the grassroots marketing campaign. Um, and on this, on Ali here, uh, what sort of things specifically were you doing? How it, and, uh, oh, what tell wasn't us about, I doing? <laughs> tell us Michael uh, Mann. Tell us about <coughs> the director and how it all worked. Michael Mann is a very talented director who is obsessive compulsive. Um, this doesn't go any further in this class. So. Uh, now he's, he's um, um, uh, he was talking to Kevin earlier about how Michael Mann, among all the directors around, makes the best use of music in his films, starting way back when he was producing Miami Vice. But uh, he is meticulous to the point of driving everyone crazy. He'll, um, uh, for example, um, the costume designer has you know designed all the principal costumes you know, set, dress the extras and, and um, uh, put them all. Michael will point to um, the 15th extra in the fourth row and say, I want him to wear a different coat and stop production for, for that type of a thing. But it's a fascinating process. Michael also has a visual advisor who um, is sort of like, you know, the parrot on his shoulder uh, who uh, and he's, he, uh, Michael is an artist, and there, those eccentricities, I guess, go along with, uh, with art. But he's very concerned with the look of the film, extremely concerned with the look of the film. And uh, he's very good at working with actors. Um, again, he'll drive his crew crazy, but he's very good at drawing the best performances out of his actors because he really um, he cares to the point of obsessiveness. So here we are talking about you working on these multi-million dollar movies that you've been doing quite a while, but when... Um, uh, None of which I get a percentage for. You don't get a... Mm -hmm. But you, uh, you started writing early. Well, I, uh, I know we talked about what your first real writing gig was, but were you writing in like grammar school, high school, college? Yeah, yeah I was pretty much always writing and that was what I wanted to be. That and a baseball player, and <clears throat> I never could hit a curveball. Uh, but yeah, uh, I wrote from the very beginning, and that was my entree to the uh, to the movie business. Except you went by way, uh, you had another six weeks in Nashville writing. <laughs> <Hotel>. <laughs> I started off writing um, country western music because I wasn't much of a musician, but I was a pretty good lyricist, and country western music seemed to lend itself to lyrics. 
So uh, I did that for um, uh, a couple of years. Um, never had any major successes, but got a lot of songs published. And, um, and then went back to L.A.? Then went back to L.A., um, started, um, I worked as a social worker for a few years, and, uh, and then bought a small horse ranch with um, a woman who knew a lot about horses and did that for a while. And uh, during that time, when I wasn't feeding the horses or training or anything like that, I started writing for television and I started writing my first film scripts. And so you, the way you got the, in the door, I don't know if you guys noticed in the bio, but um, uh, Rob, one of the first big paid writing gigs was doing scripts on spec for Laverne and Shirley, very early sitcom happening. And how did, how did you get your foot in the door there? I knew somebody on the show. But I had written um, a couple of, uh, you know, the old uh, adage about um, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. I had written several <coughs> scripts and, and television spec scripts before that. Um, uh, the, the guy who played, I don't know if anybody, has anybody ever seen Laverne and Shirley? Yeah, okay, three of you. I was actually going to go wondering four? about that, how many people had seen. Uh, is it back on yet? Is it still on? Is it really? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's classic. It's, it's, it's um, um, uh, I Love Lucy updated for like the, the 70s. Uh, but uh, I, um, I got a script to the producers there, a spec script, and they liked the script. And coincidentally, it was one that they had already had an idea for. So they didn't buy my script, but they liked my script better than the one that they had produced. So I got an assignment, and that was followed by a couple of other assignments. And, but I was always a freelancer for them. And uh, tell us about the uh, writing process when you're writing for a show like that and what the, the script meetings and the like were like. Very intense. And um, it sort of goes back to the old uh, the joke about the dying comedian who says, uh, uh, <coughs> dying is easy, comedy is hard. But, you know, it's uh, a process in which everyone is involved sometimes to the detriment of the script, sometimes to the betterment of the script. But you have a week to prepare these shows, and then you film them, uh, what I think it was the, the video's two cameras? I think that's one. Um, but that whole week leading up to is all about um, the writers getting together in a room, and you bounce ideas off, you go through, you tear apart the, the, the script, so you better have a little bit of a thick skin and uh, punch up the jokes. Then the actors come in and rewrite everything that the writers have done. And eventually, you come out of this um, you know, contortionist process with a filming script. And you go into the studio on that day and um, shoot it in front of a live audience. But tell us about the structure. Structure, as, as we were talking earlier, is everything. Structure, and structure in, in any type of, whether you're writing songs, whether you're writing screenplays, um, uh, even you know, journalism has the who, what, when, why, and where. Um, structure in uh, situation comedy, for example, you have to uh, play up to the commercial breaks. Uh, in comedy, uh, they want you to have three jokes to a page, which doesn't always get done, but uh, exposition is not really primary. Keeping it moving is, is what's... Um, uh, uh, but each form has its own structure. And uh, knowing structure and being able to adapt to structure, to adapt your writing and your ideas to structure, is what makes uh, a viable, successful writer. Um, dialogue, if you can write dialogue, that's great. But that's almost almost secondary. It's, um, it's all about how you make the story move and how you hit the bullet points along the way. And, so I know. take it that was uh, a lot harder than doing a, a regular script? Uh, in some ways, yeah. Because a script, you, you can sort of... I mean, there, there are maxims for that as well. There, there's there's a, uh, uh, definitely a script structure. You've got to be able to, to, to uh, hook your your reader in in the first 10 pages. Something exciting has to happen in the first 10 pages that's going to reveal where the story is going. You can't just spend the first 10 pages of a script on exposition. 
or backstory or anything like that. It's got to, to uh, even for a two-hour movie, uh, you've got to capture your audience uh, or your reader right away. Um, it's uh, with television, of course, it's just a more compressed version of that. And, you know, for commercial television, you have to adapt to those um, scene breaks. It, commercial television is always three acts, like a play. And playwrights, Neil Simon, you know, was very successful in television. In fact, started out in television, writing for your show of shows. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something I wish I could define it and just, you know, be able to, 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 to give a formula. But you watch enough, you know, whether it's television, movies, listen to, to, uh, to songs, um, you get an idea of where the punctuation marks are supposed to go and how the story, because what, even if you're writing a song, it's about a story, and how that story is, is, is going to dramatically stack up um, is what structure is all about. So. You know, a funny thing uh, on this, I'm wondering about comedy um, and um, an odd thing like parentheticals in a script. How, uh, is, is it more frequent or less frequent that, that the script or screenwriter is actually doing little directions like that, like that's, parentheticals? That's a great question. That's changed over the years. It used to be a uh, screenwriting form, format, um, you'd put in a lot more detail. Now that's all streamlined, and that um, there's a screenwriter named William Goldman who wrote Butch Cassidy and um, uh, oh God, what else? A lot of other uh, The Sting. Uh, I mean, he didn't write The Sting, uh, but a lot, a lot of great movies. Basically, um, he wrote a book which would be terrific for anybody who's interested in reading. It's dated, but it's still relevant. It's called Adventures in the Screen Trade, and he describes how. Uh, the process of doing a lot of stage direction, everything like that, has been thrown out the window. Not entirely. You still, you know, want to say, you know, exterior small town street. You know, there's a carriage, you know, driving along a dirt road. Uh, but the less detail, the more the story will flow on paper. And what you want when you're presenting a script is for somebody to get engaged with your story. So a lot of the stage direction that we all, as writers, love to put in, because it's a little bit of prosaic showiness, is uh, kind of extraneous to selling a, a script. And sometimes it's, um, it's an inhibitor to getting into the story. Does it, uh, does it get put back in when it starts going to the actors, or is um, that just at the sales point? Generally, when it goes to a director, the director will make his own notations on stage direction. Um, the parentheticals, you know, Will Smith laughs, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, you try to make show up in the dialogue. You try to reduce as many of those stage directions as possible because, again, that opens the door for somebody, a, a director, a producer, to use their own imagination, enter the story with, oh, I'd like to see him laugh over here. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some some actors more than others, but um, you know, the adage about it being a collaborative medium is really true. Um, there are actors who will go back and write their own pages. Um, uh, Russell Crowe. Did anybody see Gladiator? Anybody? Yeah. There's a scene uh, in that in which he's um, reminiscing about uh, life on his his farm in Italy. And that was all written by Russell. Uh, he came in with the idea one day, and um, he thought that it would be a valuable thing to have as, as part of his spoken backstory. So yeah, actors make contributions all the time, sometimes uh, on the spot, even if there's a bit of dialogue that reads great, but the actor doesn't feel comfortable saying it, um, they'll change that. Yes, sir. Russell? Yes. <laughs> yes, several. <laughs> but, um, you know, he also contributed in ways that, that um, uh, most people don't realize. I mean, 
Um, Ridley Scott and Russell were butting heads pretty much throughout the movie, but it made the movie better. Whether or not Ridley took Russell's advice, uh, it made him think more about the scene and what elements, you know, maybe work, maybe don't work. Um, and Russell did. Russell does that with with every every director. Some of them can handle it. Ron Howard was was um, uh, was great at at. Uh, engaging in that little process with Russell. And it is part of his process, it's part of his creative process, is to argue, to fight for various different things. Um, but work out really well in A Beautiful Mind and Cinderella Man. Other directors have not been so successful dealing with him. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, and that usually doesn't work with, well it depends on the actor. I mean. Ultimately, the director is the one who makes the decisions, and it's his movie, and it's, it's his vision. Um, what Ridley did, which was very smart, and some directors do this, uh, is he said to himself, sometimes to Russell, I'll shoot one my way, one your way. And he would always, uh, Rus uh, Ridley uses multiple cameras, he uses four or five cameras at a time. So he would always shoot it in such a way so that there was a piece that he would be able to use out of what was shot, so it's not a complete waste. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but, uh, yeah, sometimes it doesn't work with directors. Sometimes they butt heads and don't come out well on the other end. On a, on a process, a show as big as Gladiator, uh, with that many extras hanging around through most, there are very few small scenes. Yep. Uh, how, how much does that, the tension of getting it done, um, uh, affect how the director and the actor work together? That's a great question because it, it's, it often does. It's, um, you know, time is money on a movie uh, uh, production. You hope that most of your creative conflicts are ironed out during rehearsals or during preparation, but it never works out that way. Um, generally, uh, the director, and if you have a strong producer, the producer, won't allow those kind of creative um, uh, contests to cut into filming time. But it often means that you have to do things twice, once the actor's way, once your way. It sometimes means that um, uh, uh, the actor, um, well, you, you, the, the goal of a good director is to always make the actor feel uh, safe and, uh, and his ideas embraced. If he's got bad ideas, that's a little tricky. But you try to find, as a director, uh, you try to find either a middle ground, if an actor is uncomfortable with, with a line or, or a particular interaction, or you try to find um, a way like Ridley does to, to, uh, to shoot it and, and get a piece that you can use. Most of the major um, issues around scenes are worked out before the cameras uh, are set and before, so that you're not wasting that valuable time. Are most of the, do most of the um, uh, directors uh, now, in your experience, actually do rehearsals uh, well in advance? Yes, almost all of them do. Sometimes they'll shoot a rehearsal because an actor's energy can be at the highest when he's going through the rehearsal, so you don't want to lose that. And, and it is, it's all about getting the actors, uh, maintaining the actor's energy in that particular scene, in that particular sequence. Who's, uh, who's the, um, the most dominant director and the most dominant actor in your experience yeah. who wanted their way to happen? Um, Michael Mann is one of them. Uh, he, um, he wants control over every aspect of the filming, but he is um, collaborative with his actors to a certain point. Um, Ridley is dominant in his own way, Ridley Scott, um, because he had a, a, a dominance in that position is having a clear vision. When you go, when a director goes into um, filming, and he's not quite sure in certain parts what exactly he wants, and there are plenty of, of successful directors who do that. Um, 
um, you get lost. And uh, so a good director has that vision, and that's his frame of reference. And it doesn't have to be an overwhelming personality. It just has to be a clear vision and because what, it's easy to get swayed. What actor or actor do you think gets their way most often? Oh, Russell is one. Uh, you know, he's a bad boy. Everybody knows it. But he is, um, um, he works as hard as anybody uh, I've ever seen. He is among the most skilled actors I've ever seen. I, I would trump that with Jack Nicholson. I was going to say, you worked, <laughs> you worked the bucket list with Jack Nicholson. And I, I worked the recent uh, Jim Brooks movie, that, uh, right How Do You Know, that's, that's coming out. The bucket list was particularly interesting, though, because um, Rob Reiner had worked with him before on A Few Good Men, and, you know, Jack is Jack. There's nobody else in the business that, you know, uh, that's Jack. And Jack, first of all, would have it in his contract that he didn't get picked up before 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Uh, then he uh, and Rob Reiner, Rob would finish whatever he was doing, go into Jack's trailer and talk for an hour every day about the script. And they would make little tweaks in there, and then they'd go out and shoot it, shoot the day's work. Which also, it was, it was great because Rob Reiner was the kind of director who always wanted to, to have a short day so he could be home in time for dinner. So we'd basically film from about 1 o'clock in the afternoon until about 6, and then everybody goes home. Somehow they got the movie made. That's a time. very short work day. <laughs> that's, that's a very short work and day. And it's like about half a normal work day. You I know. know. So you, uh, you all of a sudden were uh, doing these um, sitcom scripts at Laverne and Shirley, and you started coming out. So then you, did you move into screenplays? And then how did you work into how you are <coughs> now? To, I mean, for, for a guy who... Uh, uh, just had this peripheral. Exp all of a sudden, now you you meet all the stars, you meet all the directors. Mm -hmm. How did you get from that from that Laverne and Shirley experience, and then to the PR department at 20th Century Fox? When I was writing scripts, um, again as a freelancer uh, writing scripts for television, if you're lucky, you sell maybe two a year. So I was writing anything I could I could get paid for. I'd write magazine articles. I'd write ad copy. Um, then somebody hooked me up with um, a company that made trailers, you know, the, the narration, coming soon to a theater near you, the exciting whatever. Uh, so um, I would do a little bit of, of uh, trailer copy, uh, literally anything I could, I could get hired for. And 20th Century Fox was at that time experimenting <coughs> with including a feature article in their press kits. So I started off writing feature articles on, like I did a story on the, you know, the history of, of the tattoo art for a movie of t uh, called Tattoo, a very sadistic movie. Um, and eventually I got hired, uh, the guy who was, who was hiring me to do the freelance articles moved up to be director of publicity at Fox, and he offered me the job um, of being head publicity writer. So. You I remember you right told place, me. Right place, right time. The, uh, when you were, this is, I mean, we all talk about working up from the bottom. When you were first uh, writing the articles freelance, like you were doing spec scripts to get into Laverne yep. and Shirley, that you said they were paying you, what, 50 bucks? If, uh, oh, the trailer copy, yeah. I mean, yeah, trailer copy, if, uh, if the movie, if, if it used any of your copy, even a line for the, um, uh, for the trailer, for the movie, you get 500 bucks. Not bad for a few lines. They give you fifty bucks just to 50 write it bucks on is specs. A kill fee. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's just to get it, and then five hundred if it actually makes it. Yeah, and I was such a good judge of movies that, that you know you, you you sort of have to to you know parse out your your efforts and, and your creativity, and you can't write everything. So you know I'd pick and choose. And there was one movie I, I saw in Rough Cut that I thought was totally unreleasable and, and not even worth the effort, and it turned out to be Porky's. Um, so I stopped guessing about the success or failure of uh, movies uh, after that, and just so then you were told me to write. Then you were in house, so you didn't need to. Well, let's yeah. let's look at a uh, let's look at a trailer <coughs> for a movie that you did, and um, and see. Here we go, and see what uh, a trailer uh, looks like. And this is for uh, Goonies, as I recall. Let me turn out this expand video. 
Expand video. Yeah, okay, now there it is. I was looking for the the play thing. <laughs> that multiply when you throw water on them? Take the oath. got everybody big in Hollywood <laughs> working on the same movie and you got a cast full of kids and teenagers yep. and you're on the set with them. What goes on? Uh, well, Richard Donner is a kid himself. Uh, he just, uh, uh, yeah, working on his set is like going to a fraternity party that just doesn't end. Um, and so he had a great time with the kids. I think the problem uh, of what, I mean, for me it was just, it was, it was, terrific because it was, uh, there were no big stars. Uh, it was easy. Anything I asked anybody to do, sure, let's do it. Uh, we have, uh, we filmed a lot of that in a little town called Astoria, Oregon, um, which is a poor, you know, sort of fishing town. And they had a YMCA fundraiser and the whole cast showed up for that. And uh, so we were able to do some nice things in the community. Um, Spielberg's movies are usually closed sets, so there wasn't, um, there weren't a lot of press visits. Um, the press really didn't have anybody to interview, a bunch of kids who nobody ever heard of. Um, but um, Donner is um, very clever in his ability to be able to keep the energy up. and. Um, on this one, he didn't really need to because he had a bunch of enthusiastic kids. The problem was keeping their energy contained, which was not always easy. Um, and I don't know about you guys, the first time I saw the movie, I got a headache just hearing all the kids talking over each other. But, um, you know, he fixed that in the editing and he came out with a very successful movie. Were there parents on the set? Yes. Always with a minor, there's always a guardian. And did you have to deal with any of that? Yeah, you always have to deal with that because you don't, um, just out of respect, uh, as well as the fact it can get you in trouble, you go to, um, uh, to the guardian rather than the child when you ask them to do something. And, you know, as it should be, the, the, uh, especially with a child actor, um, you know, their, um, 
they should be focused on the movie, on the acting, and not on the peripheral stuff. Um, but it's also interesting with child actors, they have to go to school for a certain number of hours a day. So you only have the actors for a certain amount of time, a limited amount of time. And, you know, so that's tricky. Did you have a question? No. I, I thought you. I understood. I, I understood <laughs> that, uh, that Spielberg had to take over. Uh, yes, yeah. Spiel the movie was, was running um, long, it was going over schedule by quite a bit. Um, and Spielberg wound up directing all the second unit action. Uh, and tell them what second unit, what kind of second unit? Second unit, unit is anything that doesn't involve the principal actors and dialogue. It's all the action, all the roller coaster stuff. He did some, um, as second unit sometimes does, they'll borrow an actor from first unit. Um, and uh, occasionally there's, there's small bits of dialogue. But it's usually second unit is usually the action. Um, and they have separate directors for that who collaborate with the editor and with the, um, uh, the filmmaker to know what pieces they're going to need. So was most of the work you did on th that particular show, uh, did most of the writing and things you do show up after the fact? Yes. Um, you write a press release to start with, just an announcement story that tells the press that this is what's going on. And uh, you position the movie at the earliest stages. Um, the press is incredibly valuable to <coughs> marketing any movie, but um, you don't want them running off on their own with their own idea of what the movie's about. You want to be able to tell them what the movie's about. So you do that in a positioning paragraph or positioning a few sentences. So you get them um, saying, you know, uh, kids' adventure in which the kids try to save their town and, and et cetera, et cetera, rather than, um, you know, a movie about these horrible bad guys who try to capture and kill these small children in a small town. So is that coming out of, uh, do you get instructions <coughs> or from like a marketing de uh, department and from like the production, like Spielberg's company, and then you interpret that and, and you start putting it out, or how does that work? It's one of the few areas in which you can actually do some original creative work. Well, tell me. Uh, because that's when you take a look at the movie, you read the script, um, you hopefully get a conversation in with a director or a producer, and you take <coughs> that which, which you've gotten from the script and shape it into um, uh, to what you think is going to best promote the movie. It's gonna, um, um, what you're trying to do is find the most exploitable elements in a film, the thing, the, the concise way of presenting the story, and then you send it up the channels and everybody makes their marks and, and says, no, you shouldn't have used those words or whatever. But the unit publicist is the one who um, generally creates the initial uh, pitch for the movie. So uh, after it's pitched to sell it, then you have to pitch to sell it to the demographic or to the, to the audience. It's generally positioned to the demographic. Um, when you write your pitch or your positioning paragraph, you have to keep in mind who your audience is. A movie like Bucket List, you're pitching to the over 30 crowd. A movie <coughs> like this, you're pitching to 17 and under. Uh, obviously, you know, the most common demographic is about, you know, 18 to 25. But um, you always also try to broaden your audience. If you have a movie that's, that's um, say, uh, targeted for 18 to 25, you might want to try to find another element in the story that expands it to, to include something of interest for 30-year-olds or something like that. So you are in a really unique position as a film develops to be the source of information to say, okay, this is what... Steven Spielberg's movie is. I wish I had that kind of authority. Uh, <laughs> it's a strategic position in that you're called on to um, sort of launch the strategy for the film. But um, as with anything else, there's so many levels and so many, you know, cooks that you're essentially doing um, 
uh, you're setting the table and everybody else um, contributes. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's in marketing as well as in filmmaking, it is collaborative. And so how long will you stay with the film when it comes out? Um, I'm gone usually two weeks after the movie is um, uh, finished production. Sometimes I'll stay with it through release. Uh, I've done that with a couple of movies. But most of the time, um, I turn my materials over, including the press kit, <coughs> which is the, uh, the lengthier description of the movie with bios of the actors and, and um, um, anecdotes about filming <coughs> that's sent out to the press about six weeks before the movie comes out so that they have um, material that they can draw on for their stories and they can spell the actors' names right and things like that. Well, let me, let's, uh, you get involved sometimes with, with uh, films on an even greater level. Tell them about Hannibal and I'll put the trailer up. <laughs> Uh, Hannibal was one where um, I was commissioned to write a website that then became a book and it was a journal of um, uh, my experience of that movie uh, for which MGM okay, let's well, let's watch the trailer and then you tell them tell them what you had to do <laughs> <laughs> So another Ridley film, <laughs> but a great deal more complex, even. Mm. Tell and us, tell us about what you. So you wrote every day. I wrote. I wrote every day. I wrote um, a book called the Hannibal Journal, which uh, again was initially um, um, uh, assigned to me as a, a website. Um, I always thought it'd be a great idea to be able to tell about what it was really like to be there on the set while the movie was being made. And, you know, uh, more about, as much about the life as about the filmmaking process. So um, I fooled somebody into uh, to hiring me to do that. Of course, when you're writing for marketing, you can't tell the whole truth. Um, you are um, concealing certain embarrassing details, but for the most part, it was uncensored. Uh, censored myself in some places but um, it's uh, it was a, a terrific experience going through that and being able to chronicle the day-to-day -day life so you just walked around the production and yep. the set all talk day to long people that's what I usually do I, you know walk around the set talk to people sometimes go to the you know craft service table have some coffee it's my job what a job <laughs> 
Well, and so you had Ridley here doing all his things, and Hopkins. What mm -hmm. was the Hopkins thing like? Oh, uh, 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 Tony. Everybody calls him Tony. Uh, it was just one of the most delightful actors you could ever work with. Um, doing a horrible part. Doing a horrible part. Well, that was his Oscar winning part. I know, uh, of course. A reprisal yeah. of his uh, Oscar winning part. Um, but um, his approach to acting is just so, he, uh, I asked him about it one day, he says, you know, how do you prepare? He says, I learn the lines and then I say them. That's okay. it. That's you know, it. That's, that's the way Anthony Hopkins approaches a role. The and fava bean line was just... <laughs> just <yeah. laughs> it's the way he said it. And a, and a fine Keanu. Yes, yes. Yeah, he was, yeah. Um, he played, um, um, what was the name of the, the, the character who was trying to capture who had then had his face eaten. Uh, he spent um, four or five hours a day in makeup trying to get that prosthetic stuff on. It was so uncomfortable. Um, he's a very talented actor, as you know, um, and um, not quite so outgoing as, as Hopkins. Um, very much, you know, in his own process. I shouldn't touch that, should I? Sorry. Uh, and, um, um, but he, he contributed quite a bit creatively in that part, and, um, uh, dramatically, uh, I thought. Uh, so as you're chronicling it, you have those two older pillars and then Julianne Moore in the middle. Yep. How did that tri triumvirate work? Well, actually, uh, I think it was Hopkins who had recommended Julianne Moore for the role. Uh, he had worked with her before on, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, but uh, when they were casting, as soon as Jodie Foster said she wasn't going to be able to do it, they started looking for another Clarice and Hopkins had recommended her. So the, uh, the relationship between them was, was great. And uh, uh, I had worked with Julianne on a small movie previously as well, and you know, she was a sweetheart. Again, actors from my departmental standpoint, the marketing of a film during the, uh, the making of it is always tangential. It's always something that has to fit between the cracks. So. You know, I could bother her about some things. Um, she would say no to others. Um, but uh, we did a bit of press during that uh, that production. She was always cooperative. And you're on location big time in this one. Yeah, we were. Um, well, that was uh, it started in Florence and then moved to D.C. And um, so you did it kind of backwards. Uh, in yeah, one yeah. We didn't start in the States. And I don't know why that was. I think it had something to do with Gary Oldman's availability. Uh, he wasn't um, available until the latter part of the production where we were filming in North Carolina. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we started off smack dab in the heart of, of uh, Firenze and uh, uh, had paparazzi all over the place. How did how did they affect? Since are they part of your uh, minion? Do you have to hold no, them in check? Or no, how that <coughs> and I will tell any director or producer who thinks otherwise that I'm not a security guard. Uh, when paparazzi show up, they can be um, uh, anywhere from from a major pain in the ass to to uh, barely noticeable. And it, you work with the assistant directors the location people and the security people to make sure that they have a place to get their shots so that they're not in the camera frame. Um, it's interesting because you get into legalities with that as well, especially in this country. Um, a movie production does not own the public sidewalks other than that portion of it that's actually in front of the camera. So if somebody wants to walk up on a piece of public, you know, sidewalk and start shooting photos, you're not legally uh, able to stop them. Sometimes um, it depends how much of a distraction it is to the, um, uh, to the actor. But um, they can be, uh, again, uh, just that kind of a, uh, a nuisance that you have to get used to or they can be a major disruption to the production process. To the marketing process, 
they have changed the marketing process completely. Uh, the paparazzi have won. Uh, basically, all the studios used to think that controlling the images to a film could get the whole marketing campaign under their authority, and then they could release photos as they wanted to whatever publications they thought would give them the best break. <coughs> That's all changed with the uh, with with um, uh, the internet. Anybody with a cell phone uh, can put a, a photo or a video up on TMZ, and the studios have to deal with it. So there's still, to a degree, the studio marketing departments are still, to a degree, wrestling with that because they're behind the curve. And it's inevitable because they can't um, manage these elements that are so vital to promoting a film the way they used to be able to. They can't control them. So it's a catch-up job. Do, um, did the actors, uh, the principals especially, on this particular movie, who knew you were writing every day uh -huh. about what's happening in the set, start looking over their shoulders? Did, were you able to stay in their good graces? How did that oh, go? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that I told them. Uh, I, I just um, knew I had the assignment, and you know I would talk to them like uh, I would in normal. I had a great relationship with, with Tony Hopkins. I, you know, I'd hang out in his trailer. Uh, one of the thrills of my working life, uh, he came in, he was, he was bored, he was waiting for a scene. He had just memorized the entire T.S. Eliot love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, so he recited J. Alfred Prufrock to me in his trailer. <laughs> At this age, my God. Just, uh, 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 so, you But know, you were putting up was, every day, right, on the web? Uh, no, uh, yeah. that was all in post. Some movies now, in fact, Peter Jackson was the first one to do it with the um, uh, Lord of the Rings, had somebody putting up website entries. It didn't work. Uh, the difficulty being that you couldn't both be, um, you couldn't be spontaneous, you couldn't be reflective, um, and everything had to go through a filter. So by the time whatever it was that the publicist had written got up on the web, um, it had basically been boiled down to, to, to nothing. I had the benefit of writing it all after the fact. I was taking notes during the process, but I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to put together a contiguous story beginning to end, and it, it, it was more of a, uh, a complete um, saga than, than just bits and pieces. But, you know, uh, I, I, I thought one more thing, we're getting close to the end of our time, mm -hmm. and I thought one thing, we've talked about nothing but wins here. <laughs> uh, and oh, uh, how about Greenberg? Oh, God. Um, uh, so here's one that didn't win. Um, Big time. Yeah. So how do you, let's look at the trailer first. And uh, we'll say again. Squid and the Whale was good. It wasn't a big commercial success, but it got him, but it got him a commercial audience. I'm going to have to the 
hope you never find out. So what do you do when it doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs> well, what you try to, to obviously uh, sell the most appealing elements of what you've got. And that was, that was a tricky, I mean, you've, you saw Squid and the Whale. Anybody else see you know, Squid and the Whale? Yeah. I mean, that was a, an interesting, quirky film with, without a really commercial hook to it. And Noah Baumbach just makes those kinds of movies. Um, I got onto it because um, I had had a relationship with Scott Rudin uh, from Revolutionary Road, and I wanted to work with him again. And Noah, you know, was, I was always curious about uh, his work. He was a very bright guy, a very literate guy. But you'll notice in the trailer, they sold it basically as a love story. And uh, it was really a story about a middle-aged guy having a breakdown. But it's not really appealing to a lot of audiences. You don't, you know, you don't say, I'm going to pay $10 to go see a, a middle-aged man have a nervous breakdown. But, um, you know, it was um, and Ben Stiller, the biggest grossing comedian, you know, certainly of, of today. Um, it was not a part that they wanted to, uh, that audiences wanted to go see him in. And I think it was sort of, doomed uh, from that uh, that conception. What were you, how were you writing it as you were going through it? Um, you know, I tried also to position it as a love story um, to awkward people finding each other in an awkward way that was very Noah Baumbach quirky and, uh, you know, trying to make it uh, appealing in that way. Um, you know, obvious elements that um, um, you didn't want. There were actually a couple of um, blowjobs in the first, in the initial script that were then cut out of the movie because the studio decided they didn't want that many blowjobs in the movie. Uh, so it was, you know, uh, it was, it was not, it wasn't easy. But you, you always, you take the essence of the material and you try to boil it down to its most appealing elements. And Did you know uh, before it came out that it was going to bomb so badly? No, but I'm not good at that, as I told you earlier. Okay. <laughs> you don't know which ones are the winners. No, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be a huge hit, but I thought that um, people might go to see the Ben Stiller performance. And um, I think that ultimately um, the studio saw that it was a limited audience. They tried to... That's all. I don't know how much time we have left for me to go into to platforming and stuff like that. But they tried to platform the movie, which is basically open it at a few select theaters, get good reviews from that, New York, L.A., and then open it more widely. And um, they didn't get the great reviews they were hoping for. And by the time they opened it wide, interest was gone. It didn't happen. Yep. Well, we're right in the last few minutes. Have you guys got any questions before we stop it up? Anything at all? Yes, sir. When you're writing a script for a television show, mm -hmm. are you writing like kind of one or two episodes, or are you writing for the entire season? Well, it, it depends. If you're on staff, uh, you're going to be writing for the whole season, but they will assign you one or two or three stories during that season, and those are your stories. Um, in um, committee meetings, in the, the script meetings, uh, it's all collaborative. You contribute to, to uh, scripts that you've had nothing to do with. But if it's a show that's been on the air for a couple of seasons, you know the characters well enough to say, mm, they wouldn't do that, or they would do that, or maybe it'd be fun if they did this. So it's both. Uh, you know, I'd be happy to read it and um, uh, give you notes. Um, you know, uh, getting a script sold in Hollywood can come any number of different ways. Um, it usually 
you know, it's the chicken and egg thing of, of um, uh, you have to have an agent to sell, but how do you get an agent if you haven't sold something, you know? Um, you know, I'd be happy to read anything that, that um, uh, anybody sent me, but um, I won't promise that I can do anything with it. That keeps me clear and, and um, uh, out of trouble and um, all that. Oh, wait, you had one over there for us? I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, generally one at a time. Sometimes they'll overlap, but uh, it's generally one at a time. And I'll do between two and as many as five movies in a year, depending on the length of the movie. Yes, sir. That's interesting, Kevin. Come out. So is, is there any way to feel like in that, or do you have to control that? Well, <coughs> that, um, I'd like to know more from you about how that uh, that no, process well works. Saying, for instance, like you know, The Hobbit hasn't even started production. Yep. I feel like I know a yep. heck of a lot about everything yeah. that's going on on the set. You know? That's that's called creating a buzz, and uh, you can do that um, on any movie. And that's also a strategic decision. Sometimes you want to create a buzz way far out at the very beginning while the movie is in production to get everybody excited about seeing it. Sometimes that can also blow up in your face because if people know too much about the movie by the time the movie comes out, it's already old news. And you say, eh, you know, I feel like I've already seen that. Let me go see something that's, you know, dark and mysterious. Uh, Spielberg, as I mentioned earlier, is one who always liked to keep his movies under wraps and then spring it on, you know, the audience when, um, uh, when it was just about ready to come into theaters. Um, different movies dictate different strategies. And something like The Hobbit, you almost can't hide because it's been so controversial in just getting made. So uh, that's a, that's, that horse has already left the barn and, and um, you know, you kind of, uh, a studio marketing department has to follow it as best they can and, and try to, to turn it in one direction or another. But you always want to save most of your um, um, marketing material for the time just before the movie is coming out in theaters because that's when you've got something to sell. Let's see. Yes, sir. What do you have going on right now? Uh, I just finished a series of movies. Well, actually, I, I did How Do You Know, the Jim Brooks film that's coming out in December, and Black Swan, uh, the um, Darren just Aronofsky. Just premiered at the New Orleans Film Festival about two weeks ago. Yeah. To a sold out, there were people outside around the block. It's really, I, I haven't seen it yet, but it won the Venice Film Festival. It, that's, that's one that's getting tremendous buzz on its own. Um, uh, it's Black. called Black Swan. And that, that's not to, to discount all the work that, that uh, Fox Searchlight is putting in behind the scenes, because that's um, also contributing to the fact that everybody knows about the movie. They released it in just the right place at the right time. At, they premiered it in just the right place at the right time at Venice, won the award, and now it's got momentum that will carry it through um, Academy season. Um, you should tell them a little bit about your your six movies here in New Orleans with the <laughs> World Wrestling Federation. <laughs> that, that was what I was going to say. So um, uh, since June, uh, World WWE, World Wrestling Federation, decided they wanted to go into the feature film business. So they put together, and it was a lot because of the success of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to create the next The Rock. And so they put their, some of their star wrestlers in feature films, surrounded by some very good actors. Um, the first movie that they had out had Patricia Clarkson and Danny Glover, and they've got another one coming up with Ed Harris and Amy Madigan, and um, uh, you know some very decent acting talent, making small movies between five and nine million dollars, and uh, they're all PG-13 sort of family features, and they could. Um, become a mini major studio um, but they have to as we were talking earlier figure out how they're going to market their movies but um, yeah so I was hired as a consultant for them to kind of 
Yeah. Yep. They did most of them, most of them in New Orleans. They, they did. They just finished one in Albuquerque. I saw some Brock Lesnar movie where he's like swapping his blue car on Canal. Don't think that was it. Was that <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, that wasn't one of them. That I didn't is. see the movie. I just saw the trailer. Nope. Like nope. Trailer. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So at five, we're going to do things just on career stuff in forum in Nuna Maker. Uh, and have one last crack at trying to make him uncomfortable. <laughs> so see you at 5 o'clock. Good luck to you.